So hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to start this session on the integrated multi-trophic uh, aquaculture by presenting our speaker, uh, Thierry Chopin, that is a friend for many years. We were trying to figure out when was that we met, but it was a long time ago. And uh, uh, Thierry was born in France, but uh, for a long time now has been working uh, in, to, in Canada. And I think, uh, so in the University of New Brunswick in, in St. John, and I think he's best known all over the world for his work on INTA, so the Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture uh, Systems, and also uh, by his uh, enthusiasm for the turquoise revolution. <laughs> so bringing together the blue revolution with the green revolution, that really means aquaculture and uh, marine activities that are really respectful and the work with the environment. I think that's a correct way to put it, right, Thierry? <laughs> okay, so I, it's my pleasure to really introduce him and to, um, so you can start, Thierry, explaining why and why is IMTA such an interesting system and why it really brings together the economic, environment and social aspects really to promote this kind of uh, aquaculture. Thank you. Okay, let me try to share. Here we are. So yes, uh, thank you very much Isabel for this very nice introduction. Uh, Thank you also to the Atlantic International Research Center uh, in the Azores uh, Islands. Um, so I would say good morning, good afternoon, and also maybe good evening, because my understanding is uh, you are, as a matter of fact, more than 200 participants from 42, at least 42 countries, which is quite remarkable. Uh, and uh, I am sure we will have a very interesting uh, question and answer uh, session after my presentation. So let me um, just uh, uh, start with my presentation. Uh, so Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture or IMTA. Uh, and I think it's a responsible way of farming our waters by taking advantage of uh, ecosystem services within a circular economy approach. So in September uh, 95, uh, there was a conference in uh, St. Andrews um, in New Brunswick. And you know, it was a time where 95 people were wondering what will happen to their computer in year 2000. So people were wondering what will happen to aquaculture in year 2000. So I um, gave a presentation called a Mix Integrated Poly uh, or, um, or here I have, uh, Uh, yeah, uh, so the presentation was called Mix Integrated Poly or Multilevel Aquaculture. Whatever you call it, it's about time you put seaweeds around your cages. Uh, so, um, oh, what's happening? Uh, yes, uh, and after that, there was, uh, I would say, in 95 to 2000, a period of preaching in the desert. Uh, we wanted to differentiate our practice from monoculture. So of course people say, well, why not use, uh, talk about polyculture? Because the term already exists. But as a matter of fact, uh, cultivating three species of fish together, which is polyculture, does not address the problem of co-cultivating three feed uh, species together. Like here you have three species of fish together. So in October 2003, for the first time, I mentioned the expression integrated multitrophic aquaculture at the conference of the Aquaculture Association of Canada in Victoria, British Columbia. And uh, in March 2004, we had a workshop uh, totally dedicated to IMTA. So we combine integrated aquaculture with multitrophic aquaculture to uh, have integrated multitrophic aquaculture. 
And I'm glad to report that since then, more than 1,400 publications on IMTA have been published. So there is quite a lot of interest worldwide on this uh, aquaculture practice. But um, so the, if you want the expression IMTA 2003, 2004, but as a matter of fact, it's a much older practice. And if you go back to 2200 to 2100 BC, so that's uh, more than 4,000 years, uh, you have a document in China called the Yu Yu Bin, which is already uh, the, um, detailing integration of fish with aquatic plant and vegetable. So as a matter of fact, IMTA started in fresh water uh, and then moved to seawater. Uh, in 2000 uh, BC, so also same period, in Egypt, uh, in the uh, hieroglyph of the tomb of Tibain, you also see uh, Nile tilapia uh, in an integrated agriculture aquaculture system with ponds, floating plants, fruit trees, quite an elaborate system. Uh, closer to us, uh, from 500 to 1848, um, the uh, Hawaiian people developed some very sophisticated integrated agriculture, aquaculture, all the way from freshwater down to uh, marine uh, farming system. Uh, they were called Haupua uh, system, uh, a remarkable system of integration. <clears throat> On much closer to us, 400 years ago, in France, um, the Chateau of Fontainebleau is an example of what I call royal uh, freshwater uh, IMTA. Uh, this castle still exists and you know, it's 65 kilometers from Paris. So it's a suburb of Paris and it's no problem to go visit it for an afternoon. But at that time, <clears throat> 65 kilometers, you had the chance of being robbed maybe three or four times uh, on the way. So the food was never arriving to the castle. The king was uh, fed up with the situation. The courtesan wanted to stay in the castle. And basically, he told them, you have to become, I don't know if it was the vocabulary of the time, but you have to become self-sufficient, uh, sustainable. So as a matter of fact, you can see the triangle pond on the right, uh, which still exists at the present time, it's called the carp pond, uh, l'étang des carpes. And that was uh, the first uh, example of royal freshwater IMTA. You have to grow your food on site if you want to stay in this castle. So what is it now, integrated multitrophic aquaculture uh, at, the, at the present time? Um, we thought uh, at the beginning that it was made of uh, three components, the fed aquaculture system with fin fish on two suspension extractive aquaculture components uh, to recover the organic uh, material with shellfish and to recover the inorganic nutrients with seaweed. So how does it work? When you add a feed to the system to uh, feed your uh, fish, that creates a nutrient zone uh, and there are different types of particles and nutrients that you have to recover. So the small particulate organic matter, it doesn't go very far. So that's why your uh, shellfish, mussel, oysters, uh, sea scallop don't have to be very far from the fish. Then you have the dissolved inorganic nutrient, dissolved nitrogen, dissolved phosphorus, dissolved carbon, uh, that travel much more. Uh, and in fact, you don't need to put your seaweed that close to the fish pens uh, to recover these dissolved organic nutrients. Then we realize we have other type of particles that are important. The large particulate organic matter that go to the bottom um, uh, quite rapidly. And also, especially when uh, your uh, shellfish aquaculture become quite significant in density, they will also release feces and pseudo feces that go also to the bottom. So we need a, a component at the bottom. That's what we call the deposit extractive aquaculture with invertebrates such as sea urchin, sea cucumber, sea worms, and why not also lobsters. There is also a fifth component uh, which I call the mineralizing aquaculture component uh, made of microbe bacteria. Um, generally speaking, we still don't know much about microbe and bacteria in the marine environment, but they must have a significant role. And all these activity at the bottom or bioturbation that send more dissolved inorganic nutrients available to the seaweed. So that's, if you want, uh, the uh, system with the five components. Very rarely do you see an IMTS system with all five components. Generally, it has two, three, or four components. Uh, but that's fine. Uh, there is many variation on the overall concept. 
so to be clear, IMTA was never conceived with the idea of being viewed only as a cultivation of salmon, kelp, blue mussel, and other invertebrates in temperate waters and only within the limit of existing fin fish aquaculture sites. That's how we started in Canada, uh, because we wanted to move from the lab to real field uh, at sea experiments, but we had also to work within uh, the limitation of the regulation in place in Canada. So you will have to put all your infrastructure within the four buoys of a salmon site. Um, so uh, we wanted to move at sea because, uh, you know, it's easy to do lab experiments in 60 liter, 100 liter, and then of course you multiply and you think everything will be wonderful. Then you transfer at sea and oops, sometimes you have surprises. So um, we did that, but uh, uh, it should be very clear that is only one of the variation on the central overarching IMTA theme. But there are many, many variations on IMTA, and I will just give you a few examples. Uh, integrated agriculture, aquaculture. Here we are in Vietnam. It's uh, tilapia uh, and rice. That's a type of IMTA. Uh, integrated green water aquaculture. Here we are in India. Uh, Biofloc uh, uh, aquaculture, picture in uh, Israel. Um, also, IMTA uh, can happen, can be conducted in fresh water. So FIMTA, but also that's what some people call aquaponics. And here are different aquaponics systems. And we have been working for the last five, six years um, with the Canadian IMTA network on FIMTA also. Uh, here, I give you an example of a typical IMTA site in the Bell Fondy, New Brunswick. Uh, so we start with salmon cages and we had a mussel raft and uh, also seaweed raft. And this site is designed that way because most of the time, 80% of the time, the currents are going, if you want, from the top uh, right of your picture down to the bottom left of uh, the picture. But uh, another site, uh, different hydrographic condition, you will design your system differently. And here are the different uh, comp uh, uh, food, seafood we can produce, the salmon, the shellfish, mussel in that case, and also the seaweed. Here you have an example of uh, 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 kelp wrap with salmon tartare that's uh, delicious and prepared at a local restaurant. But uh, IMTA doesn't mean that fish have to be part of the system. Uh, one of the very well-known IMTA uh, system is the one in Shanggu Bay in China. Uh, it's huge, uh, that's a picture from Google Earth. From north to south, it's uh, 18 kilometers. Uh, so large scale, so that's from uh, the space. Uh, but when you are at sea level, that's what you see, okay? And it is uh, uh, seaweed, seaweed, seaweed along the buoys one way. On perpendicular, it's shellfish, shellfish, shellfish uh, the other way. Uh, and the question is, uh, and I ask, I say, where are the fish? Uh, as a matter of fact, there were some fish cages, not too many. And in 2018, the government decided uh, to remove uh, the uh, fish cages. Um, the scientists were not too sure why, but as a matter of fact, yes, it's a system that works with seaweed and invertebrates. And if you do the calculation, there is not enough nutrients produced by the invertebrate to support all this seaweed biomass. So <coughs> if you want to understand Shanggu Bay, as a matter of fact, you have to look at what is around the bay. So agricultural runoff are very important. And also a lot of land-based aquaculture and uh, they discharge directly into Shanggu Bay and that's a major source of nutrient. So if you want to understand Shanggu Bay, it's not only what is happening in the water, that's also with all the surrounding drainage uh, basin. Uh, we also work uh, with a company here in uh, uh, New Brunswick, uh, Magellan Aqua Farm, um, Steve Backman, who is growing sea scallops. And I created a few years ago a company, Chopin Coastalette Solutions, and we are growing the seaweeds. Um, and you see at the bottom right, uh, scallops with uh, kelp flakes and a good bottle of uh, French wine. I'm sorry, I should have said Portuguese wine. Uh, <laughs> both are excellent. Uh, and that's a wonderful meal. Uh, one thing I would like to mention because there is some confusion between fed species versus extractive species. 
fed species for me that the species that are exo uh, genusly fed. So it means that there is feed given by humans added to the system. By opposition to the extractive species, they fed too. Uh, they, uh, everybody has to eat, but they are endogenously uh, fed. Uh, the feed is already present in the ecosystem. Uh, uh, last year, uh, Dunbar et al. proposed excretive species versus extractive species. And I say, please, no. Uh, all organisms uh, feed on something or excrete something, including invertebrates, including seaweeds. Uh, what would be the fate of an organism if it was not excreting? Uh, sooner or later, it will become internally toxified or it will explode. Uh, but uh, they, they need to, to eat and they need to excrete. So let's be clear, endogenously fed extractive species rely on feed already present in the ecosystem, even if some of, the, uh, some of it is originating from the co-product of the co-culture exogenously fed species like fish in an IMTS system. So uh, I have seen recently people saying, oh, seaweeds that zero input food. That's not right. Um, there is no free lunch. Everybody has to eat. Uh, you eat what is already in the water column uh, or you eat what is added by humans, but there is no zero input food. Uh, so the Western world and the Asian world have evolved differently with IMTA. Western world groups have been working on IMTA uh, over the last two, three decades. Uh, small scale pre-commercial IMT operation by modifying fish site to co-cultivate invertebrate and seaweed. So I call that the fish approach to IMTA, fish in the 70s, 80s, invertebrate and seaweeds in the 2000s. And uh, we should be uh, clear, commercial scaling up has not been easy. Uh, while the biological and environmental advantages of this practice are generally accepted, the adoption barriers have been mostly economic barriers and regulatory barriers. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum uh, in Asia, uh, Asia, as I mentioned, have a long tradition um, of using different IMTS system in freshwater, in seawater. Uh, so um, there is no need to convince people about the advantage, the benefit of IMTA, no need to convince the regulators of the advantage and benefit of IMTA. And their approach has been diametrically opposed. They started with seaweed site in the 50s, then they added the invertebrate um, in the 80s and the fish in the 90s, but they have been removed uh, a few years ago. And the scale is uh, much, much different. Uh, so, um, we need to rethink um, uh, how an aquaculture farm is really functioning. Uh, Western IMTA has generally developed within the restrictive limit of existing fin fish site because that's the regulation in place, but it doesn't reflect the ecosystem scale at which aquaculture farm really function. Uh, we have different nutrients, uh, small particulate organic nutrients, large particulate organic nutrients, dissolving organic nutrients. They need to be recaptured, but they travel differently. They are uh, released at different times of the year. So we need different special and temporal strategy uh, to uh, design. The term integrated in IMTA has led to some confusion too. Uh, it should be understood as cultivation in proximity but not considering absolute and often arbitrary distance, like in some countries, it's 500 meters, one kilometer, five kilometers. All these numbers are magic numbers. They, and when they are in regulation, it's very difficult to change them. So that's why I've always said in proximity, and I have never mentioned an absolute distance. What is important is to consider the connectivity of the water bodies and the sediment in terms of how your whole ecosystem functions. Uh, so it means that different components of an IMTS system do not have to be right at the same location. The fish, the invertebrates, the seaweed don't have to be within the four buoys of a site. What we have to move on is towards the idea of entire bay, coastal area, region as a unit of IMTA management in what I call integrated coastal area management or ICAM strategy. And of course, that will challenge traditional aquaculture regulation and policies. But we have to move of these things. Everything has to be solved within one site, 
nature doesn't work like that. So the placement of the different component of an IMTS system on the scale at which it will be managed will certainly trigger change to regulation as um, regulation in many countries were never designed with IMTA in mind. Uh, so regulation governing aquaculture have often been designed with a single species, single group of species in mind, just like uh, we have done before with fisheries regulation and we know it doesn't work because it inhibits a more holistic approach by not considering species interaction and uh, ecosystem-based management approach. Everybody talk about ecosystem-based management, not too many people uh, put it really in place. So we know that IMTS system should and will continue to evolve uh, because the IMTA concept is extremely flexible and that's the beauty of it. It can be applied worldwide to open water on land-based system, marine and freshwater environment, temperate and tropical climate. So there is no ultimate IMTS system to feed the world. And as a matter of fact, it's different climatic, environmental, biological, physical, chemical, economic, historical, societal, political, and governance condition that will lead to different choices in the design of the best suited IMTS system for your region. I cannot come with a, a formula already pre-cooked for where you are. So IMTA is a concept, it's not a formula. And that's very important. And then we have to adapt it, adopt it to the region with what you have, with the species you have, etc. So it's not enough to consider multiple species like in polyculture. They have to be at multiple trophic level based on their complementary function in the ecosystem. And they should also have an economic value or an economic potential if you want the industry to buy in. Uh, also one thing that is very important, there is nothing that says that only one company should be in charge producing all the IMTA component. Uh, as a matter of fact, we thought it will be that way, but it doesn't work because salmon people are good at salmon, uh, mussel people are good at mussel, seaweed uh, people are good at seaweed, but it's very difficult to find a company that is good at everything. So what we have to go is more to the concept of several companies coordinating their activity within the uh, integrated coastal area management. I know easier said than done, but that's what we have to look at. Different company within uh, the same region coordinating their activity. So until now, uh, seaweed and other extractive species have been valued only for their biomass and food trading value. But economically, if we want to calculate IMTA full value, they also need to be valued for the ecosystem services they provide along with the increase in consumer trust and societal political license to operate that they give to the aquaculture industry within a circular economy approach. So what are these ecosystem services provided by seaweeds? I already, already mentioned seaweed are excellent nutrient scrubbers, so especially for dissolved nitrogen, dissolved phosphorus, dissolved carbon. Um, also with IMTS, seaweeds can be cultivated without fertilizer on agrochemicals because the fed component provide these fertilizers. Uh, but for that mentality, we'll have to change. Uh, we uh, will have to move from what we consider before waste or byproduct uh, of one species. Now we have to call them co-product, which is typical vocabulary of circular economy. And this co-product can be used as recovered fertilizer, feed resources on energy by other species, which are then considered as additional crop, providing economic diversification in more efficient and responsible food production system, while at the same time, bioremediation of coastal nutrification is taking place. Uh, but IMTA is more than a story of nutrients. Uh, it's maybe uh, <laughs> sometimes too dumb to say, but we have to say it. Seaweeds do not need to be irrigated. Uh, they are already in the water. So in places where we know that water is a huge issue, irrigation is a huge issue, well, you have a crop that is already in the water. Uh, seaweed cultivation doesn't need more arable soil. Land transformation doesn't need deforestation. Uh, seaweeds can be used for habitat restoration 
and for increasing biodiversity. So here we have a, what we call here a lumpfish uh, within our kelp. They use it as a kind of refuge. Uh, and lumpfish is very important because that's one of the species that can uh, graze uh, on fish uh, that are uh, uh, covered with some uh, sea lice and these lumpfish will eat the sea lice. Uh, and the beauty here is uh, you can have more habitat on ET2. Uh, so you have an habitat, you create a refuge. Of course, you harvest it from time to time, but any field, the potato field, the carrot field, the wheat field will change over the years, uh, over the season. So it's the same thing here, um, but you can heat your habitat. Uh, seaweed is the aquaculture component providing oxygen while the other animal and microbial components are consuming oxygen. Uh, seaweed can sequester carbon dioxide and participate in the slowing down of global warming. I put uh, sequester in a quotation mark um, because uh, for me, seaweed are sequestering nutrients in a transient manner, but not at a geological time scale. Uh, and there is nothing wrong in saying transient sequestration. As a matter of fact, uh, look, when you have a jury that is sequestered uh, for uh, a trial in court, the, the jury is sequestered for a few days, for a few weeks, but after that it's released. And uh, uh, so transient sequestration in court, uh, transient sequestration with seaweeds. Uh, so you have seaweeds absorbing the nutrient, you have them, you move them on land, on land, they will be eaten directly or they will be processed. So your carbon will be transformed. The form of carbon will be transformed, uh, but they don't disappear. So it's a transient sequestration, not a sequestration at geological time scale. Uh, by sequestering carbon dioxide, they could also reduce coastal acidification. And here, be careful, I didn't say ocean acidification, because I think we will never grow enough seaweeds to change the pH of an entire ocean. But at the coastal level, within a bay, at the intake of uh, shellfish hatcheries, we can use seaweeds to locally change the pH and then improve uh, calcification, for example, of uh, shellfish or coral reefs. Um, also, IMTM multi-crop diversification approach, growing fish, seaweed, and invertebrates could be an economic risk mitigation and management option to address pending climate change and coastal acidification impact, which will increase the res resilience of the aquaculture sector. If you want here to summarize what I like to say to salmon aquaculture people, don't put all your salmon eggs in the same basket diversify your portfolio. We know that if you play on the stock exchange, you have to diversify your portfolio. In agriculture, you have to diversify your portfolio. In aquaculture, we should diversify our portfolio. In terms of increasing the societal political license to operate, increasing the aquaculture societal acceptability. An example, for example, is could we combine uh, IMTS system with wind farm? Uh, so that uh, we will reduce the cumulative footprint by combining the two activity instead of each activity saying, I want a piece of the cake. Uh, if we combine the activity, reduce the footprint, I think it will be much more acceptable uh, to society. Um, now, the value of these important services to the environment and consequently society are never accounted for in any budget sheets business plan of seaweed farm and company. So let's calculate, just as an example, the economic value of just the nutrient bioremediation services provided by the world seaweed aquaculture production. So these ecosystem services, I think at the present time, we are in the phase of recognizing they exist. Ecosystem services and seaweed provide some very interesting ecosystem services. We are just realizing it. The next things will be to give a value to them. And uh, after that is to use uh, financial uh, and regulatory incentive tools. So for example, the seaweeds uh, industry, 32.4 million ton, 13.3 billion. Uh, if I look at the average composition of nitrogen and how much it costs to remove them, um, the, uh, for nitrogen, it's between 10 and $30 per kilo. Phosphorus is around $4 per kilo. And uh, carbon, be careful, it's $30 but per ton. So if I calculate the ecosystem services of the world 
uh, seaweed production, it's at least 1.2 to 3.4 billions, uh, as much as 26.2% uh, of their present commercial value. So it's about time we talk about nutrient trading credits. Uh, and um, what I would like to show you is because at the present time, everybody is focusing on carbon, uh, carbon tax, carbon credit, carbon sequestration, but there is more money to be made with nutrient trading credit than with carbon trading credit. Nitrogen trading credit between 1.1 and 3.4 billion, phosphorus much smaller, 51.8 million, and carbon just 29.15 million. And that is because you remember it was $30 per ton, not per kilo, and everybody forget about that. So, the recognition on implementation of NTC would give a fair price to seaweed on extractive aquaculture. And then when we have recognized them, put a value on them, we could use them as financial and regulatory incentive tool to encourage single species aquaculturists to contemplate innovative practices such as IMTA as a viable alternative to their current practice. Uh, we need to integrate the economic and societal aspect of IMTA. So we have 11 publications on the economic value and benefit of IMTA between 2007 and 2019. Uh, I gave you a summary here. Uh, one of the uh, uh, study from uh, Caras et al. Uh, what the message here, the NPV, the net present value of IMTA in the different scenario is always higher than the NPV of salmon monoculture. So IMTA in the long term is more profitable than salmon monoculture. Uh, the industry knows that. Um, we also tell them that's your data, that's the data you gave us. So um, you should trust them because that's based on your own data. So when will you accept them and uh, adapt uh, uh, IMTA more uh, rapidly? We have to think about the intangible societal benefit of IMTA gain earning uh, consumer trust on societal and political license. We did some um, surveys with Ipsos Reed, a very well-known survey company. Uh, here is the population of New York State in the US. What do you think of uh, farm fish? As usual with urban populations, they don't know exactly where their food comes from. So 48% is indifferent with some positive, with some negative. Then we show them a little video on IMTA. What happened? The indifferent category has disappeared and we have 88% of people in favor and still 12% uh, not in favor. But the opinion have changed quite substantially. Uh, there is a need uh, for uh, enabling regulation change instead of the current empering regulatory hurdles. I published that, the case of New Brunswick, Canada, how regulation may inadvertently prevent innovation in aquaculture. I don't have to talk, uh, time to talk about it today, but it's very important. In several countries, including Canada and Norway, aquaculture legislation has been built according to the salmon schedule, but not considering other species. So as a matter of fact, it's preventing uh, the development of innovative uh, practices in aquaculture. So some people say, where does IMTA contribute uh, to the, where does it fit within the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Um, I would say IMTA is right in the middle. Here are the 17 uh, Sustainable Develop uh, Development Goals. People say, oh yes, you are aquaculture, so you are in number 14, life underwater. But as a matter of fact, we are in uh, 11, uh, in total, 11 uh, sustainable development goals. At the level of the biosphere and also uh, on land, at the level of uh, the economy, uh, sustainable development goal 12, uh, 8, 9. In terms of society, we have an impact with 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, 2, 2, sorry. And then, of course, we have impact on the overall uh, partnership uh, SDG 17. So you see that we are much more than SDG 14. We are involved in 11 of the 17 SDG. So uh, IMTA has quite a role to play. Uh, we should realize that we are still in the infancy of Western IMTA. Uh, agriculture uh, has been progressing for centuries. It's still not perfect. So why should IMTA be perfect in 20, 30 years? Uh, science and society need time to think and evolve. Adoption of IMTA will not happen overnight, especially in the Western world. 
when people are still preferring monoculture, linear processes on short-term profit. So we will need patience, determination, and persistence to get people to see the environmental, economic, and societal advantage of growing complementary species together, creating circular economy processes instead of linear, and thinking sustainability in the long term. So I like to say, if people are against fast food, I am against fast science. And for that, I will give you the example of the car industry. The first battery electric car, the Prius from Toyota, it was developed in 93, first said in 97. The first hydrogen fuel car, uh, the Mirai, also from Toyota, uh, to uh, Toyota, developed in 92, first sell in 2014. And at the present time, they are still not the predominant vehicle on the road. So there is problem with incentives, there is problem with refueling, logistic issues. Um, uh, so the, um, Toyota knows that very well. And Toyota will tell you the new horizon for Toyota will be 2050. So with much smaller budgets, um, uh, I think IMTA uh, will also take some time to arrive to a new horizon. Um, now, I will just also comment that at the present time, some people say, oh, see, we are having their moment. Uh, and you see uh, some quite amazing title in the news every day. Uh, seaweed are nature climate warriors. Uh, seaweed helps save us for climate catastrophe. Seaweed, a planet saving anti burping drug for cow. Uh, seaweed will save the world. Uh, how seaweed can save the planet. So a new ocean ecosystem engineer. Seaweed forest can help fight climate change without risk of fire. Uh, seaweed eat carbon. Uh, seaweed feeding the world, seaweeds, the ocean heroes, the zero input food, no, uh, etc. The seaweeds, the underwater superheroes. So, what I want to be uh, commenting on is seaweed have their moment, but I hope it's more than a moment and it will be a long term uh, thing. Uh, so, we should be careful, and I think we have a responsibility collectively to identify and even denounce the silver bullet uh, solution person. You know, in the time of the oil uh, rush uh, to California, there was a snake oil uh, people. Uh, now I am afraid there are some seaweed oil people that are ready to uh, promise you wonderful things. Uh, but we have to be careful because between period of promising the moon, there are period of what I call purgatory period, which are very difficult for scientists and entrepreneurs that want to continue on seaweed because during this period of purgatory, scientists, entrepreneurs get the message, work on something else. You are wasting your time working on seaweed. So there is these uh, waves with uh, the uh, crest of the world. So we have a crest, for example, for the whole crisis in the 73, 79. So big projects, the Bain Biomass Project, the Gas Research Institute, um, they will produce biogas, biofuel. Uh, we haven't seen yet one drop of commercial biofuel from seaweed. And then we had 35 years, 40 years of purgatory, difficult to continue to work on seaweed. Myself, I persevere, I was determined, I continue to work and I don't regret it, but it was not easy. And then since the last few years, we have seaweed for biofuel, methane reduction, carbon sequestration, etc. cetera. Um, let's be careful. If we promise too many things, we could be uh, uh, putting us in a situation that we will not deliver on then how many years of purgatory will we have to endure. So we should be very careful. Uh, restorative, regenerative aquaculture, um, that's the latest fashion. Uh, seaweed and sea cucumbers, I would say, are the new poster child of benign aquaculture. But what do we need to regenerate? Regenerate to what state? Uh, was there ever a climate state of or nirvana or perfect nutrient balance and habitat for all uh, without flocks? I don't think so. Uh, we should be careful. Will too many excited species remove too many nutrients from the ecosystem? And will that not become a problem? And we should talk, we should listen to people that are already cultivating seaweed at a very large scale. And talk to the uh, Chinese, the Koreans, the Filipinos, and they will tell you, we have to be careful, too much of a good things can be a problem. So will we have to regenerate the regenerative aquaculture one day? 
uh, for example, here that we are in Zanzibar, in uh, Madagascar, uh, on that uh, sea cucumber aquaculture. It's so dense, there will be an, in a not too distant future, uh, a problem when this sea urchin will not have enough to graze uh, on the sediment, they will have to be provided some food. So let's be careful. Um, uh, too much of a good things, uh, including seaweed, including invertebrates, can be harmful. And we are back to the old adage, everything in moderation. And what does that mean? We are back to IMTA concept, uh, diversify your species, different function in the ecosystem to balance the things. So in terms of regenerative aquaculture, I would like much more to talk about a balanced approach to aquaculture because there will be a point where we will have to regenerate the regenerative aquaculture, I am afraid. So at the recent conferences, people talk a lot about the blue growth, the blue economy, the blue revolutions. Uh, however, we should also recognize that it's need to become greener. So it's time we combine green on blue, and it's time we talk about the turquoise growth, the turquoise economy, the turquoise revolution, because frankly, how is, how often is the uh, uh, water of the ocean the water of the Blue Lagoon? Very often, the water of the ocean is turquoise, not so blue. And on that, I will say thank you very much and muito obrigado. Thank you, Thierry. This was really excellent, as always, a presentation. And um, we have already several questions and, and I ask everyone that is interested in, in asking questions to write in the Q&A. And um, I would start asking you um, about, so there are two, two uh, attendees that would like to know first if you have any examples of IMTA in Brazil and also, how can IMTA help Nigeria to be autosufficient so since they need a lot of fish proteins and they are very far from being self-sufficient? Well, in, in Brazil, um, yes, and um, I see that... Uh, yeah, Wagner uh, is here. Wagner and Patricia. And, uh, Patricia are on. Yes. So I will say, uh, yes, there are some very interesting work on IMTA in Brazil, uh, uh, led by uh, Wagner and, uh, and uh, Patricia. Uh, there is also in the northeast of, the, uh, of Brazil, there is some very interesting work uh, uh, done by uh, uh, Prima Aquaculture, Aquaculture Organica, uh, and there they are cultivating uh, shrimps, uh, oysters, seahorses, sea which is interesting, uh, and uh, hopefully soon also some seaweed. So yes, uh, there are some very interesting work uh, done in, in Brazil. Uh, uh, there is also uh, the potential, you know, uh, shrimps, uh, some are uh, in salt water, but some are in brackish uh, water. So there is a lot of potential for uh, brackish freshwater uh, uh, IMTA. Uh, there is also in Brazil, my understanding is uh, they have a lot of water reservoirs, so we are talking fresh water there, but because of the climate change, uh, these water reservoirs, the, the level of water is going down, but they, of course, some people will still want to produce the same amount of fish. So if, if you have less volume, but the same amount of fish, you uh, increase the concentration of nutrient and all things. So it's time also, I think, for IMTA in these freshwater reservoirs. Uh, in Nigeria, yes, it's, um, it's a country I don't know at all. So uh, I have to be careful. And as I say, uh, there is no... Uh, magic formula for IMTA, you have to adapt it to your region. So I will not give you uh, uh, IMTA uh, key operations. Uh, we will have to work with the species and uh, again, in which uh, habitat, what species of uh, fish, uh, invertebrates, uh, seaweed at sea, but also uh, aquatic plants, if we talk about aquaponics. Uh, and uh, yes, also there is, um, 
you know, people say, oh, we need proteins, so we need fish. Uh, but they are proteins uh, in invertebrates, they are protein in seaweeds. Um, so they, they are also very, uh, you know, uh, people say, oh, uh, uh, to get your omega-3 and everything, uh, uh, you should get uh, eat fish. Don't forget, uh, with a bowl of uh, shellfish, you get also uh, maybe more uh, omega-3s than with the same amount of fish. So um, don't forget, uh, uh, invertebrates and seaweeds are also very uh, nutritious uh, seafood. But again, for Nigeria, we, we, uh, I'm sorry, we, I think there is a huge potential. I would say all Africa, uh, all Africa has a huge potential for aquaculture and we really have to develop it. Yeah, actually I have a follow-up question from uh, Carlos Antonio from Angola. And he, what he's, he asks you is about, you know, the need for the knowledge of local species. I think this is a very important point. So how can, countries that want to develop IMTA for feeding the population. Um, I mean, does this need a lot of, also a lot of technology and technological developments, but also how much knowledge do they need for their uh, local uh, and species? Yes, it's, uh, it's important local species and uh, in, when I talk about IMTA in our region and the other region, I am not interested in introducing non-native species. Uh, introducing non-native species is just adding extra problem and the regulator will not like it and we think so. We don't need to add extra problem from the beginning. So we should work with uh, the species we have. <coughs> and again, it means we need quite a lot of their biology and um, uh, to understand how they work and uh, which uh, species are the best one. For example, for uh, sea cucumbers, there is some sea cucumbers that are grazers uh, to the bottom, but there is still some sea cucumbers that have fans and they collect the particle and then they put them in their mouth. So as a matter of fact, they are not deposit grazers, they are still part of the suspension uh, system. So you need to know the biology, you know, you need also to know, to understand how they feed, um, do they feed together, do they not feed together, etc. So the behavior is also very important. So we need to work a lot on the, what do we have, um, what role, what is their uh, function in the ecosystem? Do they provide nutrients? Do they absorb nutrients? How do they absorb? Like for example, mussel, we, we started with mussel and we thought at the beginning, oh yes, we will have salmon mussels and kelp, so that would be wonderful. But then we realized mussels are very good nutrient uh, particulate uh, uh, absorbers, but they filter small organic particles. If they are bigger than 100 micrometers, they will just reject them or release them as pseudofeces. So the larger organic particle, they will not touch them. So that's when sea cucumbers, sea urchin, uh, sea worms, lobsters uh, come to the pictures. So yes, we, we need to know the biology, the physiology, the biochemistry of the species. Uh, so a lot of fundamental uh, academic research before we go to the applied research. But yes, uh, we should always try to use local spaces. Okay, thank you. Now maybe a, a different question uh, for Marco Costello uh, that asks that, uh, well, despite some anti-aquaculture views that we, they are very frequent in, in our part of the world, this small, especially small scale IMTA, this is all ecosystem-like aquaculture or nature-based solution uh, aquaculture. Uh, it's probably can actually help the environment, as you said, with all these ecosystem services. And you talked about all these ecosystem services that you can get money from, but there are others like habitat, providing habitat and all those things that can be also uh, interesting. And also that you, when you have this aquaculture, you may you, you don't have, for instance, trawlers coming in. So it's also, it also protects the environment. Mm -hmm. So how, what do you think that, um, so how do you think that you can um, really promote this, this uh, practice also to, 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 uh, to improve environment and not just 
to not harm the environment. Oh, I, I, I and see. Actually, sorry, and actually, is this working when you really do it big scale like in China? That will have probably much higher impacts on the environment, uh, even if it's the same, the, the same approach. Yes, um, uh, it's important. I think at the present time, we are just recognizing worldwide these ecosystem services. Uh, and we are not very good so far at putting a, an economic value. I, I just give you an example with the nutrient from seaweed uh, recovery. But of course, there are many other uh, uh, ecosystem services, not only of seaweed, but the other extractive species. Um, we, uh, that's the difficulty at the present time is to say yes, uh, seaweeds uh, on that. <laughs> I've been working for 40 years on seaweed and for 40 years I've been saying, you will see one day seaweeds will be important. Now we have this thing, oh, seaweeds are important. They, they will change your life, the climate change warriors. And everything. So the, it's to find yeah. the happy medium because there's too much hype at the present time and we are promising the moon. But at the same time, I want to say, yes, seaweed and other extractive species can improve the situation. Um, but again, in moderation, uh, we have to be careful. Um, now, for example, uh, when we talk large scale, uh, uh, for example, the Chinese telling you, well, my system doesn't work only in the Bay. I have to consider what is around. Mm -hmm. uh, last week, we heard the people from uh, Korea uh, at the EABA conference saying, well, if we have a dry year on the rivers are not supplying the nutrients, um, we will have to fertilize our seaweed because we have so, so much seaweed biomass. We have the people from the Philippines telling you, well, in some places, we have so much kappa ficus uh, uh, acuma farming that they have an impact on nutrients. So now we are thinking of following period, growing the uh, seaweed for a while, then maybe a year without cultivating so we can regenerate the nutrients. So here we are talking about regenerating nutrients. We are not talking about decreasing nutrient level. So uh, yes, uh, and again, everything in moderation, everything balanced, and that's where IMTA, I think, has a role to play. Because at the present time, I see some people say regenerative aquaculture, which is funny because regenerative comes from the agriculture world. And it's about preserving the soils, preserving nutrients. And regenerative aquaculture is all about we need to absorb all these nutrients. So <laughs> it doesn't work in the same direction. But also, um, some people say, oh, we need shellfish, we need seaweeds, no fish. Uh, and I am sorry, um, nothing We growing, need the nutrients. <laughs> nothing we need the nutrients. water. You need some, the soup has to be rich, but not too rich. Uh, so we need, and I think that's where IMTA can be important, these ecosystem services, but they have to be understood. Uh, and also understanding if, if you push too much in one direction, that can be a problem. And that's why I say, listen to the Chinese, to the Korean, to the Filipinos, they are the one that are doing cultivation at large scale. We in Europe, in North America, South America, we still are amateurs. We are growing a few tons, they are growing much more. So they have seen the impact of full scale and we should listen to them. Well, actually now I was going to talk, uh, ask you a question that is a little more technical because um, there is a, someone asking that is, I understand IMT is not a formula, but how can we ensure that extractive species are actually bioremediating the effects of the fed species in terms of nutrient emission? I think, especially when you are in an open environment, this is very, very often the critic of uh, IMTA that cannot be done in open water because you cannot really move the nutrients in directions that they should to, to be uh, absorbed by, by, by the seaweeds. And, so how can you plan this? So you are, of course, you already said that this has to be seen at a larger scale, not just one. And of course, 
I mean, the, the nutrients are going and if they are uptaken by, by, by seaweed, it, even if it's not those that are close by, but how can you plan this really yeah. technically? No, it, yeah. it, it's, it's a big problem. I, I think the only uh, papers uh, that have shown real interesting data on nutrient budget, again, that the Chinese, that the Koreans, um, because they are growing uh, extractive species at a scale that can have an impact. And I know I have that question, regulators in Canada say, well, uh, sh show me that your seaweed around uh, the salmon cages are uh, 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 attenuating, decreasing the level of nutrients. And I said, well, yes, Mr. or Madam regulators, just let me grow more seaweed and more shellfish and I will show it to you. But as you don't allow me, uh, I will not be able to demonstrate to you. So um, the theory is there, the practical aspects are confirmed by people that at the present time can grow at scales that are meaningful enough. And again, as in Europe, uh, North America, South America, uh, be, uh, as mentioned, the biggest problems are economic demonstration on regulatory uh, impediments. And at the present time, I said to a regulator, I will be more than happy to demonstrate an abatement of nutrients in the bare fundy, but let me go things at the scale that can show it. <laughs> yes. So maybe our time is running off, but I'm just ask, going to ask you a, a, a final question. So do you think IMTA or aquaculture can completely substitute fishing? How and another one, how difficult is to educate fishermen, artisanal or industrial to become fish farmer or IMTA farmers anyway? Um, I would say there is room for two, for both. Uh, you know, um, fisheries is getting a lot of plaques and oh my god they are overfishing and da 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 uh, it's terrible it's terrible uh, there is room for fishing and again there is different type of fishing there is the coastal community fishing there is industrial fishing um, there is room for fisheries there is room for aquaculture um, I mean look uh, you know people tell you uh, aquaculture now is more than 50% of seafood in the world. Uh, and in the paper we published with uh, Barry Costa Pierce uh, just a, a few weeks ago, uh, we say we have to be careful with calculating the means. It's when the means mean nothing. We get a, a little more than 50% of aquaculture, but uh, if in uh, New Brunswick or in Maine for uh, Barry Costa Pierce, if it was really 50-50, uh, half of the time we eat fish, we should be eating a freshwater carp <laughs> from China, which is not what it is. And still in Canada and in the US and in Europe, there is still a lot of uh, seafood that come from fisheries. So there is room for both. Both can be improved. Fisheries uh, technique can be improved. Uh, aquaculture technique practices can be improved. IMTA has its role. Um, it, uh, but both have their uh, place. Uh, and also there can be some very interesting system of uh, uh, fisheries and aquaculture integrated system uh, where aquaculture can be replenishing the fisheries. So combining fisheries and aquaculture is also a very interesting integrated possibility. Um, now, uh, to educate uh, fishermen to move toward aquaculture, to move toward uh, IMTA, it's quite a change in mentality. Um, are people ready? Is society ready? Are the incentives ready for a switch uh, or a gradual thing? Uh, in many places, the programs, uh, social programs are, are not really in place. Uh, so, uh, it will be, um, that's what I like, for example, today when I heard that there is more than 200 participants in more than 42 countries, I say, wow, uh, that allowed me to reach uh, to a, quite a number of people in different parts of the world. And, and it's, par it, it's a beginning. Um, it will take time, as I say, 
IMTA will not happen over time. We need uh, determination, persistence, perseverance, uh, perspiration. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, that will happen, but it will take time because in the Western world, we are still linear way of thinking, short term of way of thinking. And IMTA is all about uh, long term, about circular processes. Uh, it will take time. But I think uh, climate change uh, recognition will force some issues. Also, um, co COVID-19 uh, has been a very interesting thing. One of the things out of COVID is we need um, a shorter uh, uh, chain uh, delivery system, a food chain delivery system. And uh, IMTA is a way of locally growing uh, fish, but more than fish, invertebrate and seaweed. And you know, the FAO is saying it's not only about food uh, security, it's about nutritious food security. And that thing that the diversified diet, we uh, didn't have time to talk uh, today about uh, dietary shift. IMTA could be part of the dietary shift, which means consuming seafood, less uh, carbon intensive uh, species compared to uh, carbon intensive species on land. So there is also IMTA is part of this uh, dietary shift uh, to improve uh, the, the decarbon, to help in the decarbonization of this world. Well, I think you're a very good example of someone that persisted. I mean, you've been really promoting this and uh, um, and uh, really being the person really, I think, uh, at least in, in, in our part of the world that has been more associated with this IMTA. So I think that's what we, we need to do. I think we came quite, quite a long way. This is now go, being at least acknowledged in the mainstream aquaculture industry. Before, I remember that when you start going to the aquaculture, from the seaweed meetings to the aquaculture meetings, that was really the start. And now I think it's recognized in Europe. It's, not main, it's still, still not mainstream, and you explained, I think, well, why this is still not the main the main form of aquaculture, but I think there are really now conditions with climate change, also biodiversity considerations, that uh, this, uh, this uh, ecosystem-like uh, aquaculture, like I, um, it's really going to persevere and really yeah. turns not the only kind of aquaculture maybe, but really uh, a main form of aquaculture system. And now I think we need to go so no, but we, we, we have progressed quite a lot. I mean, yes. 20, 25 years ago, being at the Aquaculture Association of Canada, the European Aquaculture Society or World yeah, Aquaculture Society, nothing. I was, please, please, can we have a seaweed session? And now it's, oh, please, please, could you organize a seaweed session for us? So we have been progressing. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. That, uh, and you have been... Uh, one of the people really to, that made this possible. So thank you from all of us, the seaweed people and IMTA people. <laughs> and uh, well, thank you all for the questions and for being there. And uh, I think we need to leave now. Yep. So thank you, Jerry. And uh, I hope we can meet soon in person. That has been a really long time. And uh, I've, I've never been to the Azores Island, so yeah, exactly. I, I have heard it's a wonderful place. <laughs> yes, you've been here in Porto, where I am. We had a very yes, nice yes. port wine, but yes. not in the Azores. So next time we'll have to be there. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. -bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. -bye.